Uh, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here and at home and give a talk. I don't have to travel. Uh, yeah, my talk maybe should have been ahead of Dan's talk because I'm going to address the issue how he would get his SPD in the first place. So and uh, so I looked already up already the abstract, so I figured that I might be able to skip technicalities because Dan is going to do them for me. <clears throat> so certain things I will not fully uh, detailize if you want. But and the next thing. I will maybe focus more on things. Which still have to be done and are not clear than just giving the results. There will be a result at the very end. And the result is in a paper everybody can read. And this is about a joint work with Franco Blandoli and Umberto Papalaterra. Uh, that's what we did in, in, in Pisa just before the pandemic hit. And then we had to flee from Italy back to London. And I was flying with my wife from Rome to London in an Airbus 320. And we were the only two passengers. So you have to match this. Yeah, it's a private flight. So this was cool. Yeah. So what is this all about? So this is now about this. Uh, this famous paper now, which wasn't in 1976, but this guy now won a Nobel Prize in 2021, and. He came up with a vision in 1976. So actually, there's a part one, there's part two, part three, but the vision is already in this 12 pages paper here. And the vision is so he was looking into climate variability. And the question was, where is this coming from and how can we model this? And the idea was okay, so this guy was obviously a statistically mechanics trained person. So he was thinking of weather like acting like little particles, like when we just justify certain equations in physics, looking in a microscopic picture and then scaling and getting a picture at macroscopic scale. And he just translated that into climate. I mean, that was there before, but but the vision was to treat the weather in a way as a particle. That's why I extra puts this here. So you have uh, slowly responding parts of the system like oceans. And then these weather particles and, and 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 the idea is that the weather in a way drives the climate through random forcing. And that's where we have to <clears throat> kind of justify where's this random forcing coming from. So. So this is. Uh, uh, how this went, this was almost forgotten after 20 years around 2000. And the mathematicians didn't pick it up either. That just happened about 2000. Uh, and, and then there is here now this. This. Using uh, users here. So this work here is a 100 pages paper. By our late. Uh, very good friend Maida. Who, who worked at Courant. And, and, and he was in a way the first person really picking up this idea and, and, and trying to analyze it from a from a rather rigorous mathematical point of view. But when you look into this paper itself, you find that many things are still physics type and there's lots of rigor missing. And things can go wrong when you look into certain uh, limit behavior. But anyway, this paper is, if, if you have time, is a very good reference. So this was already about 2000 and then more and more people picked it up. And, and Dan has given a huge list of, of references how this stochastic model reduction became a, a posh subject in a way. So now I want to give you an example where this is coming from. And this is in the title. Those are these so-called primitive equations. And one of the founding papers is this very famous paper here, 1992 by Lyons, uh, Lyon actually, that's the French, Tamam and, and, and Wang. So they look into uh, polar coordinates of a 3D velocity, and they're mainly interested in ocean dynamics. 
So you can think about more or less surface motion in, in, in the ocean and they wanted to uh, yeah, uh, into the dynamics of this. So of course, in comparison to the Earth's radius, the depth of the ocean is small, so they scaled it down by that difference here, right? So, 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 so the vertical parameter will be h and will be on a much smaller scale than the radius of Earth. So we have temperature, salinity, pressure, density, and some reference values. So then you see here the system of equations. It's not so important to understand now the details of this equation. So those are a type of primitive equations. They were then refined and there's still lots of fundamental research going on about the pure mathematical properties of those equations. So it's more or less Navier-Stokes, as you can see, applied to, to an ocean situation. And what, what are here the most important things? So when you look at this as a, as a statistician, and there are not many parameters seen. Now this is, this is what, what you have to notice first. If you have such a system here, and you want now to, to, to fit this to data, what I mean, we have the transport term, we have a little bit of viscosity parameters here, yeah, then we have these, these reference things here, but they are on a minor scale. So we have a, a rigid system of equations with almost no parameters to fit to. I mean, the viscosity is definitely not the driving thing for the climate change in a way. Yeah, so, so there's not much statistics in these equations in that form here driving what is going on. So you need something else. You need definitely outer forces, right? The outer forces are missing here in these equations. They didn't, so this is actually copied from the paper. But they gave this as an example of the mathematical object they wanted to study. And that is then, they turned this into, into a differential equation in an infinite dimensional space. And it just simply looks like this. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm not doing the partial derivative, I just write it like this. So that, that takes values now in infinite dimensional space. And they have, of course, here now a forcing. They have linear operators and they have a bilinear form. And that is the one which I, in a way, pointed out here. The bilinear form comes from the transport mechanism. And then, of course, the linear operators are Laplacian and uh, yeah, so, so we have unbounded linear operators in the game. So definitely the forcing is not very welcome because the forcing is something which changes, like impact of sun and, and, and other things. So, so this is now covered by this forcing part here. Still, when you think about it and you want to study climate and you have now really a physically motivated equation, you're still missing how this could change over time. There's nothing here that, that these things as they stand when they come from this physical equation, that they depend on time. You know, that Laplacian wouldn't depend on time. Yeah, and the bilinear form, neither. So you can't just add simply here a time dependence just like this when you come from, from physics. What you wanted to do, because certain things change, obviously, because we change the world as we all learned, right? So, so we have here now this type of system. We have to come back to this a bit later. I just want to point it out. Yeah, this is, this is how you go. You first do that physical system thing, and then you look into what you can do mathematically. So we have now a system like this. What you see here now is a brutal math way of of dealing with this right really to give meaning to the equation because they are unbounded operators you need here that kind of it's even more than a Gelfand triplet you need just a hierarchy of Hilbert spaces to really make sense of everything which goes on that you finally have a solution and depending of course as we all know on the initial condition and on on the property of the driving force so now we come to what we did and what other people did and what, how this is studied at the moment 
when you try to find models for climate through this route. So then the first thing is we are not doing this because this is far too complicated. There's still lots of work for pure mathematicians to really run this through the full mechanism. Now, following these pioneers here, and many people do this, you simplify. The bilinear form is just simply one on, on one and the same Hilbert space. So you don't cover really these unbounded operators. Right? And not, neither with A and the forcing term, they're all put into a gigantic Hilbert space you have to choose as a practitioner. Now we, we just come to this in a second. So we are going away from, from, from the pure mass description of that, so you're making already a mistake. It's not like this. On the other hand, when you approximate this and you run it on your computer, this is what, ha what is happening because you always have to work with cutoffs and the cutoffs kind of reduce you to a big Hilbert space in a way. You just have to make sure or you might have to change these BNA functions slightly. What is now the thing, you know, remember the first slide told you something about fast scale and a slow evolving system. This is what you have to capture next. So this Hilbert space now has to be, has to be split into two things. One captures low frequency and one captures high frequency effects. And the low frequency effects, of course, are those you would think would survive when you model climate. And, and that, that thing here, which gets this yeah, attention-seeking symbol infinity, of course, is, is a high frequency part. And when you scale time, you go to climate scale, then you hope that this is becoming a very easy kind of random term. That was a vision of this now Nobel laureate guy. Yeah. So, but it's not totally obvious how to choose your orthonormal basis of that Hilbert space. You have to adjust it to what you want to measure. Because these eigenfunctions or basis vectors you choose, when you integrate it against your solution process, have to give you the measurements you can do, or at least simple functions of this. So this is why you have to be careful with what kind of first finitely many basis vectors you choose for climate modeling. So, so what could that be? So think about the Gulf Stream and you want to understand how this changes over time. So definitely what you could check is maybe a huge chunk of the surface at some area, maybe close to Cuba, 50 times 50 kilometers, and the depth of 100 meters, the chunk of the Atlantic Ocean, and you take the average temperature of this. So how do you get this? You get this by a certain basis, which is maybe a Haar basis, which is a rectangular thing in higher dimensions. So you can do things like this. Yeah. So you can therefore describe cubicles like this where you're interested in measurements, and, 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 and that would actually then, then give you a measurement on the average temperature of a 50 times 50 kilometers piece of water 100 meter deep in, in the Atlantic Ocean, and you just study this, the dynamics of this thing on a longer time scale. Yeah. So, yeah, now it comes. Yeah, high frequency, low frequency, and the low frequency ones are these climate variables. And that is a projection of the big Hilbert space down to the to these kind of slow evolving, or you, you expect slow evolving scales. And that is a projection which projects into uh, what you hope is going is to, to go away. So now this is just very simple algebraic operation, you just take the original equation and apply your projection, you know, then the force is projected, and then you project all these operators. You give them different names, and, and each z splits into an x plus y, and I just calculated all these bilinear terms here. 
So I made it kind of symmetric by just combining. So there is, of course, there is here a B12 and a B21 per term, and that term here covers, in a way, the sum of it and makes it symmetric. So, and you get now a system of equations. This is the one you want to turn into your model, and this is the one you want to discuss away. You, you want to find an easy description of that y and then plug it in here and then see what you can do with this. But what you learn from this is there's definitely still a physical meaning in these things. They come from these differential operators projected to certain subspaces of a huge Hilbert space. Like you saw with the original equation, when you do polar coordinates, your differential operators might pick up other uh, parts of the dynamics, and the same can happen here, right? It's a projection on something which you choose. You have to choose your own kind of uh, measurements you're interested in as a practitioner. So now this climate modeling happens. This is now the step which, which is in a way behind that 1976 paper. So that first comment here is, is experience. Yeah. That, and that's why I actually gave these coefficients here tilde because they change now. Uh, here's already something to be fit. Now, this is coming from the microscopic structure of, of this, these Navier-Stokes type primitive equations. And you say, when, when, when I really go to, to, to a time, which is uh, uh, to, to, to climate time, dividing by a small parameter here and making that very long that I just see uh, the, the system evolving in, 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 in very large steps, then what I see here is that the forcing, is, yeah, as I wrote, is rather small and the self interactions are small, which, which gets this extra factor epsilon to be checked. Yeah, three minutes left. So time is running out like this climate here just before, right? So, and, that, and then here, so this step is is, is the second part on the first slide where I said these weather particles are just acting like noise. So when you go to that time scale, you want to replace this thing, this is a vision, by just an on Stone-Back type construction. So this is more or less the trick. So now you just plug this in. Yeah. You so so you do now the so so you 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 denote the, the fast running system of, of, of the low frequency by x epsilon t and the, and the rest by y epsilon, you definitely want to understand the limit of that. That should converge to something and that should just go somewhere. So, so this looks here all pretty nice on, at first glance. And here is the problem. You have to do something about this. So, so you have a linear part in your equation. You have created here something else when you just modeled something you don't understand by an ornst back process. So you get this structure here with respect to that space scaling. And we can do everything in a way in the paper. This is just simply done for the minus mu. That's why I replace this here. But it is easy to be done here for any lambda when, when this thing here generates a semigroup or something. You just need just an upper bound on the spectrum because you, you, you need a little bit negative here. Yeah. So then you can, so th those are the mild form of equations. We have seen several of those today. And and what we now look first into is into this term here. Yeah. What, what we realize is when epsilon goes to zero, that just produces a Wiener process. But that, that didn't matter that we started with an ornst back process. When we now look into the scaling, we get a Wiener process. That is that Wiener process then plugged in in the beginning. This is the one you get. 
you get that from this limit. And that is just a very easy you know, thing that is all in the paper when you look this up. It's only a weak convergence. You have to test again to function in time. And you get this. And here, when epsilon goes to zero, you just get that Wiener process. So then we show in the paper that that converges to some process. And now we come to the problem. Yeah? When we now look into this, what remains on the high frequency side, then we created that thing here. This is the one which goes in, in dense equations, uh, just like so. He takes it from 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 an observation like this. So then we, this is a complicated term. We don't we neglect this one, and that's very hard to. There are there you make assumptions on this. It's not justified. Nobody knows. You have to think about it. What to do with this thing? Now this is not rigorous at the moment. At the moment, omitted from the calculation, which is a mistake. And then this looks nice. And then you have that thing. And you think because of this little epsilon here, this is a good term. But this is not just just uh, we, have, we have several people running over time in the first session. So I think and I'm, I'm almost there. It, it's very quick. So this is a hard bit for those uh, hardcore mathematicians among you. You have to look into a system like this, and the epsilon is at the wrong part here. And the problem is that that vector field here can take both signs. If this thing is only negative, everything is easy. But this guy here, you don't. That comes from from that limit, and that is creating a problem. That is open still. What we did in the paper, what everybody else did, neglected. Yeah, still open this thing. And then finally, we have a result like this. You neglect this. You plug everything in, then Y disappears. So this is now this type of SPDE, where you, where you know in a way what 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 these matrices here mean, because it all comes down to matrices because we are finite dimensional, and you have here Stratonovich integral because whenever you do a limit and you have an integral against the mollified thing, you get the Stratonovich integral. And then you have a correction term here. Yeah, that was actually that is a message of that paper that you get an extra term, and that is maybe my last comment. This is why it is useful to do this as a pure mathematician because that gives now the practitioner an extra term which was not in, in the original equations, which came from 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 in a way looking into a limiting procedure. So you know now that when you fit this stuff, that there's an extra bunch of of coefficients. And, and, and independent Wiener processes popping up, and you have to address them in the same way like Dan addressed it when you want to estimate these things here. Here you can fit now something. Yeah, this is, this is what you get. And, and you have in that Wiener process, you also have the same, because it's, in a, it, it's, it's a Q Wiener, Wiener process, you have the same problem of coefficients, of variance coefficients Dan was talking about earlier in, this, in, in his talk. And, and here is this paper, but you, you find it by name anyway, thank you very much, or whatever on the good show. Thank you. Um, perhaps one very quick question and a very quick answer. Yes, sir. a clarification. So in, in, in Hasselman's paper, he says the, uh, the ocean is the climate variable because it evolves slowly. And the atmosphere is the uh, uh, weather variable because it evolves very quickly. But my understanding is that so so the ocean should evolve deterministically and the atmosphere stochastically. Is that what you're advocating, or is the other way around? At ocean level, but you can add other variables like atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. So it's a couple thing. Yeah. Scaling procedure, right? Right. And, and that ad hoc term on the Ulbeck type ad hoc term might be on the atmospheric side because okay. this is on the high high frequency spectrum, which is the atmospheric side. Perfect. No Thank you.